welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Guess what? Today is an exciting day, something I've been waiting to share with you for months, and I finally am able to. Today, you are going to get to hear chapter two from Becoming a Sustainable Runner, the audio version that you can go get yourself a copy of after you listen to this chapter. We wanted to share with you a few sample chapters so that you could kind of get the gist for the three sections within the book. Now, this is obviously in the first section, Sustain Your Runner's Mind and Body. We chose this chapter uh, intentionally and I hope you're really gonna enjoy it. Once you listen to this, you can head on over to Audible if you're a first time Audible member. By the way, I'm not being paid to say this. Uh, If you're a first time Audible member, you can get the book for free and then I think it'll be $5.95 a month after that, especially if you click the link in the show notes, I know that is the case. However, I'm not suggesting that you do something else if you do want to make a different choice after you've listened to the book, feel free to do that. Um, And if you are not a fan of Audible or do not want to use Audible, you can also check it out on Google Play. And there's another link in the show notes, audiobooks.com. I believe that's the link. Whatever the link is in the show notes, you can go check it out there if you want to go use an alternative. Now, you are going to get to hear the actual audio version. This was the one recorded in the studio. So it's going to sound slightly different to how I usually talk because everything has to be very precise and set at a certain cadence uh, within an audio book. But that said, I am very excited to present this to you. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the audio book. If you want to hear hours and hours of my voice, (laughs) feel free to go take a listen. Thank you so much for listening. And I want to thank one of our sponsors before we get to this episode, which is AG1. I have been using this for years now. It is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning. Uh, It is my ritual. It is the one thing I actually keep on top of. 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients go into every single scoop. You put it in any drink. I tend to just like it in water when I wake up. You can get a special, uh, the offer I'm going to tell you in um, Canada in the US, in the UK, in Europe. I wanted to just mention that upfront because I think a lot of the offers I have are usually just for US. This one is worldwide. Athletic Greens AG1 has distribution channels all over the world. So you can go check that out. And friends, this is something that I use to take care of my body, knowing that no matter what I'm doing, no matter how much travel I have, no matter how many things I have going on in my life, and as you may have noticed right now, there is a lot I know I can rely on my AG1 to give me that boost of energy. It's like an insurance policy for my health. I know I'm taking care of my health. I know that no matter what I eat the rest of the day, I am going to be okay. So you, as a friend of mine, can get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five free travel packs by going to drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. That's drinkag1.com forward slash Tina. I've been using this for years. I cannot imagine my life without it, and I cannot wait to hear what you think once you check it out. All right, let's go hear one of my chapters. Chapter two, bolster your confidence. You just finished your long run, crushed it. Basking in that post long run glow, you remember that it wasn't always this easy. You used to wonder after a couple of miles, am I seriously going to make it another 10? Your brain would go into hyperdrive. I can't do this. But you did. And now you're going further than ever. You know to break the run into smaller sections. Just make it past that mailbox. Just make it past the maple tree. One chunk at a time. Get it to 90 minutes. Let's shoot for two hours. Hey, only 60 minutes to go. And then you did it. You completed a distance that not too long ago would have been unimaginable. Beaming, you sit down on the ground, chugging water you have been looking forward to for 45 minutes, your fatigued legs thankful for the break. As you gulp the sun-warmed water, you log into social media to celebrate. I did it! Except the first thing you see is another runner who also ran long this morning and started around the same time as you did. 
their 24 mile trumped your 20. And how did they rack up so much vert? All the energy, momentum, and pride leaves your body as your post inhalation fades into a low hum of anxiety. Not only is that other runner fast, but they're a dang good writer too. Okay, you Glenn Doyle knockoff, did you rip this right from Brene Brown's magnetic fridge poetry set? But it sure makes your semi-cohesive ramblings pale in comparison. Dang it, I only have 12 likes. Did I seriously skip brunch for this? You are left deflated, disheartened, and not so much of a rock star anymore. Maybe you will celebrate when you can run 24 miles in four hours. And so we move the line and keep chasing the dangling carrot. The day we feel content will never come. Why does their achievement make ours any less valid? It doesn't, but we all know the physical reaction we experience at moments like this. We've all felt it. In everything we do, there is always someone better, stronger, or more deserving. It always hits us like a physical punch in the gut but we can learn to sit with those emotions rather than numbing them or pushing them away. These aren't quick fixes or simple hacks. They require the deep work and growth that can change every area of our lives, not just our relationship to running. Let's dive in. Avoid self-sabotage. Believing we are enough sounds simple, but it also seems like the kind of woo-woo advice that doesn't actually change anything. Really, it is both simple to do and useful for combating feelings of insecurity, but ineffective unless we go deeper. First, let's work through why we struggle with feeling like we're not enough. British anthropologist Robin Dunbar claimed that early hunter-gatherer societies tended to live in groups of 150, which is known as Dunbar's number theory, and has a lot of supporting research. Other research has yielded different findings, with one study stating that 291 was the approximate network size. Regardless of the actual number, our brains simply aren't built to handle the amount of social information we're bombarded with today. While it can be tough to imagine now, we weren't always witnessing everyone else's strengths and successes multiple times a day. In those hunter-gatherer societies, we would have had strengths within our tribe that we were known for being skilled in. We would have embraced that strength and used it to support the tribe and strengthen our group survival. Today, we look at our strengths and compare them to millions of other people with millions of other circumstances. It can make us feel we are not good at anything, that we fade away into the background, that we don't even matter. We live in a culture of near constant not enoughness. We log into apps and see how we train, eat, parent, work, dress, and even live is somehow not enough. Unhelpfully, these apps also provide us with detailed data and analytics on the specific ways we're not enough. With social media, peers' training data is placed directly into our hands. How did their easy runs get so fast? Would I be faster if I pushed the pace on easy days? Post-run, we log into Strava, the most popular social media app for runners and cyclists around the world, and scroll through our feed. It is easy to believe that everyone around us is training harder and more. Ugh, now we feel slow. So we log out and head to Instagram for some inspiration. But instead of seeing an uplifting story that makes us feel empowered, we see a stream of posts from peers that make us feel worse. Am I the only person without a six pack? Some friends are running through the Grand Canyon just days after they were running along the beach in California. While we're on the same old loop we've been running for years. We see others climbing Mount Kilimanjaro when our vacation was to our parents' lake cabin an hour away. We see a humble brag about a friend's dream job. Someone else moves into a huge custom home while we sit on our old worn out sofa. We see families welcoming new babies while we struggle with infertility. We feel trapped in our boring job or a city we don't love because we have to make ends meet. Some of the mistakes runners make in training and racing comes from a place of believing they are not enough. Many people feel they need to be hard on themselves to obtain certain outcomes. If I accept myself where I'm at right now, what will motivate me to get out the door and go for a run or get to the gym? Can I still improve if I accept myself for who I am? As runners, we are used to motivating ourselves. We often get up early to fit in a run before we leave for a family event. 
We do hill repeats near our vacation spot to make the most of the hilly surroundings. But sometimes what starts out as healthy motivation can turn into a detrimental drive to define ourselves by outcomes. We might desire a specific race goal or athletic achievement so much that we feel like we're nothing without it. We obsess over it, cling on to it. If the race or training run goes well, it feels really good, but that feeling is fleeting. It may pass more quickly than it came, and we are left seeking larger and more lasting accomplishments. Counterintuitively, such an approach tends to have worse outcomes. With a narrow and hyper-specific focus on results, we make poor decisions about our training and succumb to the temptation that more is better, because at least it's productive. We might push our long run a few miles further, run five miles more than last week over the three on our schedule. A few days later, a minor injury pops up. We feel guilty about a run over the weekend being shorter and slower than intended, So we skip a rest day and push the pace on Monday, knowing we have another workout the next day. When we are married to a specific time goal or finish position at our next race, we might make increasingly harmful decisions to try and protect the outcome we're envisioning rather than adapting to circumstances as they unfold. If we keep hitting a wall at mile 20 of a marathon, rather than pausing to assess our nutrition, we might think, I don't have time to stop and take a gel. I have to keep going to meet my goal. Go big or go home. We continue pushing the pace. Our fuzzy logic tells us the quicker we get to the finish line, the quicker we can fuel up. Of course, this strategy rarely works. Our goal race time slips out of our grasp. Rather than easing up to make the best of a bad situation and switching our focus to enjoyment, we deem ourselves total and utter failures and spiral into a hole of self-pity. This self-sabotage is common among goal-driven athletes, says Adi Bracey, quote, I've also seen scenarios where athletes who attach too much worth to an event actually self-handicapped themselves and essentially took themselves out of it before they had the chance to fail. It's a form of self-preservation where an athlete can say, well, I didn't go all in and that's why I fell short. When there is so much at stake, these athletes subconsciously make the decision to give themselves an out or fall back on an excuse because the idea of going all in and falling short seems unbearable, end quote. Rather than pivoting to respond to actual events as they unfold, we make decisions tied to a non-existent outcome because our ego depends on it. Instead of loosening our grip, adjusting our goals and taking that dang gel, we give up, unable to be fully present in the race as it unfolds, already planning which race we will sign up for next to redeem ourselves. Spending time in this virtual hall of mirrors can distort our perceptions of self that directly affect our training and alter the way we view ourselves as a valued human being. Social media, and media in general, thrives on generating a feeling of inadequacy that drives us to spend more money and more time online to build up our self-esteem and sense of self. Though it's easy to imagine we're immune to this kind of thinking, it's the philosophy that drives a billion-dollar ad industry that leverages our attention and insecurity. It's no coincidence that advertisements touting clothes, makeup, supplements, and other material goods are interspersed between images of our peers who seem to already have these things. We can comprehend on a logical level that more money, success, travel, and friendships do not make us happier. We can understand that joy is available to us in any moment and that we only have to look to find it. Yet we find it hard when feelings of insecurity bubble up inside us. According to Christy Peoples, a trail runner and mindfulness and meditation coach, quote, if we don't think we're enough, we show up at a deficit to whatever it is we're attempting to do. Before we've even begun, we're running in opposition to ourselves. That not only depletes morale and performance, it can also leave us more open to injury if we're not fully invested. It can also look like getting easily overwhelmed and shutting down at the first sign of struggle, or lowering our expectations, withdrawal, and refusal to do the hard things. End quote. The more we focus on that feeling of lack, the less likely we are to make careful and intentional decisions. That same feeling of somehow not being enough can drive much of our decision-making in life and in training if we're not careful. But we can fight back with a radical tool, unconditional self-acceptance. Thank you. 
Thank you to Tracksmith for all your support with everything that I am doing with Running For Real and beyond. I am so thankful for this relationship that I have with this brand. And I do call it a relationship intentionally. If you have seen about my book event that I hosted in Boston uh, just recently, you will see that I called this a relationship. It is not transactional. It is not you do this, I'll do this. We have a, a friendship, we're besties, and there is with good reason, because I believe in all that Tracksmith is giving to our community to make our world better. They do so many different things within the community to show support, to put their money where their mouth is and care. Because now we want to find brands that care about our world and want to make the world a better place. And Tracksmith is that company. In addition, of course, to making incredibly high quality products that are long lasting. And that is one of the biggest things we can do if you want to make changes to be environmentally conscious is to get quality items that last a long time and can handle the the toughness of the way that we as runners treat our clothes. I want to just tell you about a few of my favorite items. The Lane 5 shorts are my favorite shorts. I, I know I always talked about the Session Speed shorts. I think I've shifted to the Lane 5. They have five pockets. They are perfect for marathon racing or ultra racing. Uh, one of those is zip pockets. The others are perfect for gels. Uh, they sit nicely, they do not ride up, and they are just very comfortable. So those Lane 5 shorts I am really enjoying. We are also just about stepping into the stage where my fave item of all time with Tracksmith, the Brighton base layer, is just coming into its own. This is the number one product I recommend for people who are new to Tracksmith, the Brighton base layer. It is ideal for fall, ideal for winter, ideal for just taking with you anywhere. I do take it on most trips that I go on. So as a friend of mine, if you have never used Tracksmith before, you can use code Tina New to get yourself $15 off your order at $75 or more. If you are a current Tracksmith uh, customer, you can use code Tina Give, and that will give you free shipping and you will make a donation to Track Girls uh, on behalf of uh, yourself to show your support. So thank you so much to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode, for supporting me. I encourage you to go check it out at tracksmith.com forward slash Tina. Learn self-acceptance. Self-acceptance is acceptance of all of an individual's attributes, positive or negative. Self-acceptance enables us to appropriately evaluate our efficient and inefficient features and accept any negative aspects as part of our personality. It can feel relentlessly optimistic, especially to those of us who have been raised to be hypercritical of the world or to look out for what can go wrong. But the truth is, optimism isn't a predetermined set trait. It can be developed and cultivated just like unconditional self-acceptance. Even if it feels unnatural at first, we can all learn to love and treat ourselves with respect. Many of us struggle with this concept thinking, how the heck am I supposed to accept the negative parts of myself? I understand I'm supposed to love the good parts of me and practice gratitude, but I want to change the negative parts of me, right? Why would I accept them? Because accepting them is step one towards a fulfilled and meaningful life. All those people on social media who love who they are and are comfortable in their own skin practice unconditional self-acceptance. That is the only way to get there. We cannot be comfortable with who we are while only loving the good parts of ourselves. Those of us with low self-acceptance might try to boost our sense of self with achievements and accolades, which can manifest as increased self-one-upmanship. We might sign up for a marathon, hoping that the temporary rush of achievement will quiet the deeper sense of insufficiency, but telling ourselves we simply love being able to race. We may even feel better, albeit temporary. Coming out the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us signed up for race after race. Rather than learning from experience that there is more to running than finish lines and medals, we jump right back in almost as if we were trying to make up for the time we missed with more race photos and more events. Once the immediate post-event glow fades and the likes stop rolling in, those same feelings of insufficiency start to creep back in. Instead of seeing that our premise was flawed, we assume the problem was with the level of achievement, not the process itself. Hmm, if running a marathon isn't enough, maybe an ultramarathon will do the trick? 
Unfortunately, this is a temporary fix for a deeper problem. When we finally hobble away from the finish line, clutching our belt buckle or emergency blanket, we feel the same sense of what's next that we felt before the endeavor. When will it ever be enough? Do we have to destroy ourselves to the point of no return before we realize that races are never going to fill the void? While running and racing bring a myriad of positive mental and physical health benefits, using running to mask a problematic sense of self-worth will force us to chase increasingly bigger feats and to be constantly obsessed with lowering our personal records, still feeling like we are never enough. Contrary to popular belief, self-acceptance is different from self-esteem. Self-esteem ties self-worth and value to achievements and outcomes and will fluctuate over time. Our self-esteem feels secure when work is great, when our family situation is stable, when we PR'd recently, and when things are generally going well. However, this can break down when our world is uncertain, when we lose a job, end a relationship, or fail to finish and see a DNF next to our name on the results. Our self-esteem can suffer. Self-acceptance, or a deep belief in our innate worth regardless of achievements and outcomes, can counter the roller coaster of self-esteem. Embracing all parts of ourselves doesn't mean we stand in the mirror naked each morning and stare lovingly at our bodies. We don't have to blindly adore all parts of ourselves. It means recognizing and accepting rather than carrying shame or fear about our deepest characteristics. Bracey believes you can both accept where you are and hope to grow. She says, quote, so instead of thinking of it as bettering yourself, I like to think of it as committing to personal values, such as the desire to grow, learn more, work hard, etc. When you look at it that way, you're not seeking this destination of a future version of yourself, but instead committing to a certain way of being and doing each day that still should ultimately lead to improvement and fulfillment, end quote. We need to approach goals from a place of wanting to do well, but not needing or expecting it to protect our egos. Says Bracey, quote, when you attach your self-worth to an event, your ego is at stake. That's a lot of power to give to a race or event. One outcome of removing that pressure that I have seen in athletes is that they are actually more willing to take risks or go bigger than they were before. Athletes that don't attach self-worth to an outcome also tend to have more sustainable careers or seasons and typically perform better. When you're taking a loss as a sign that you're not enough, you can't see it for what it is, a chance to improve. Those with a healthy athletic identity are able to dissect the disappointing races and learn where they can do better next time, end quote. Not only can you still progress as a person and athlete when you accept yourself unconditionally, but it may actually help you improve more quickly and for a longer period of time. Anyone who runs enough to, say, pick up a book about how to sustain more running likely attaches part of their identity to running. That's not a bad thing. It's okay to love the part of ourselves that is committed to running and be fascinated by the way our body moves through space. Acknowledging that identity helps us commit to the work that running requires and helps us relate to our goals in ways that are productive. Our athletic identities can help us find community, build relationships, seek resources, and stay engaged in the daily process that running requires. For many of us, our closest friends are also runners. Running gives us the opportunity or reason to travel to parts of the country or world we might otherwise never visit. Being a runner teaches us how to work through hard situations, life skills that have helped us endure tough phases. There is no doubt about it. Beyond the physical and mental health benefits, identifying as runners has given us a lot. The pitfalls emerge when we conflate our worth with our identity. We might start to think, if I could just get my marathon time under four hours, then I'll be happy. Or, once I finish an ultra, I'll finally feel fulfilled. Assigning so much worth to an event outcome, one that we don't fully control, leaves us devastated when we don't get the result we want. It's not just a bad race. We are bad. We understand that all of this may sound hollow coming from two runners who have written a book and competed at the elite level. But unfortunately, hitching self-esteem to accomplishments is actually something conventionally successful people do. We know that relationship all too well. Those who have had a taste of success can have even lower self-esteem. How can that be? Runners might especially appreciate the concept of the hedonic treadmill, partially because of the running metaphor. 
but mostly because it's an experience many of us identify with. The hedonic treadmill is the idea that our happiness is calibrated to a baseline no matter what we do or what happens to us. When we finally win that race, get that promotion, or land that book deal, our happiness will temporarily spike, but it will quickly return to a set point. We then readjust our expectations to match the status quo of our experience, and then need even more stimulus or accomplishment to maintain the same level of happiness. The higher up you go on the ladder of accomplishment, the smaller the improvements and the harder it becomes to feel pride in what you do. What was once considered a success soon becomes a terrible day. While it is easy to look at elite runners and think, well, if I achieved what you did, I would be so happy. The reality is you wouldn't. If you could run at the level of an average elite, you wouldn't think, yep, I've made it. This is the best. You'd be looking to Olympians or UTMB Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc winners, believing that you would be satisfied if you were at that level. If you went on to reach that level, you would want to medal or set a course record. As our logical brains know, running is relative, so we are never going to be content and satisfied if we view our running with this conditional approach. So how can we step off the hedonic treadmill? While hedonic adaptation might not be something we can escape entirely, our happiness levels are not set in stone. There are ways to recalibrate our baseline. Since hedonic adaptation occurs partly because of the repetition of experiences, such as running one 5k PR after the next, or gradually rising through the ranks at the office, one way to reset our baseline is to mix things up. Instead of focusing on lowering that 5k time again and again, sign up for a marathon. If the fun and spark of road running starts to fade, head to the trails for a new challenge. Gratitude can be a powerful antidote to feeling stuck on the hedonic treadmill. Paying attention to what you're experiencing in the moment and savoring the enjoyment of a specific experience beyond its outcome can attach meaning to different aspects of an activity. Rather than trying to exceed 20 miles on a four-hour trail run, refusing to waste time by taking a break, stop at a particularly beautiful point along the course and stand there for a few minutes, experiencing each of your five senses in that moment. Take a mental snapshot to be able to return to later. Once you can do it standing still, work on doing it while running. Reverse engineer situations where you can prioritize finding gratitude in the moment over the outcome. If marathon PRs aren't bringing the same level of satisfaction they once did, or you're experiencing a performance plateau, try a 50k with dramatic scenery. If running has become all about getting from point A to point B, try focusing on adventure, whether that's on the trails or taking a break from competition. Trail running can be easier to take breaks, refuel, and focus on the experience, not the results. The added challenge of racing on variable, tumultuous terrain adds to the fascinating complexity. Or instead of focusing on where you want to be in your professional career, take a few moments to identify and write down what you are grateful for in your current role. This doesn't mean you can't keep striving towards that promotional PR. Just don't let those feelings of insufficiency dictate the process. Christy Peoples also recommends cultivating a mindfulness practice to bring awareness to areas you find challenging to appreciate. She says, quote, without judgment or agenda, mindfulness helps us be present, not ruminating in the past, nor straining towards the future. That means we have more access to our power in present time. We're not in resistance to what we fear might go wrong. When we're paying attention, mindfulness plays nicely into all that we do. End quote. Self-acceptance, just like running or any other discipline, is a habit, a practice that must be cultivated over time with care. Work on orienting your mindset towards one of being rather than doing. As People says, self-acceptance also means allowing yourself to simply be perfectly imperfect. End quote. Friends, it is that time of year, the best time of year for runners. We get to enjoy the time as the weather cools, as we can get outside and make the most of working away through the humid, hot summer, getting to the best part of the year. One thing I want to remind you, though, this time of year, often runners forget to remain hydrated. We think, oh, the weather's cooling off. I don't need to think about that anymore. And that's just not true. 
Regardless of whether you're a heavy sweater, a light sweater, or anywhere in between, you need to make sure your electrolytes are staying well topped up because you are a runner and you are sweating. If you're not sure if you're a heavy or a light sweater, uh, definitely go use that fuel and hydration planner uh, that I will give you a link to in the show notes. It is free by Precision. You don't have to use Precision products to use it. I definitely encourage you to go check that out. But I want to remind you this time of year, we got to continue being on our hydration. It's going to help your body recover. It's typically used by athletes to stay hydrated and recover faster after intense exercise. So if you have a goal race, you don't want to let it slip out of your hands now by not taking care of your hydration when you've done so well all summer. I love the pH 1500, but you may find uh, one of the other strengths works better for you. As a friend of mine, you can use code Tina sent me to get yourself 15% off. That's code Tina sent me. And that applies to the, the hydration that applies to the gels and all the other things that I have talked about and used in my races this year. So go to precisionhydration.com and use code Tina sent me. Zoe's thoughts. When I first started writing professionally, I lived for my next big byline. Dreaming of my name in print, I spent hours every day researching, pitching, and writing stories for all kinds of magazines. As every new writer soon learns, getting started means enduring a lot of rejection. And get rejected, I did. Every rejection email from an editor felt like a personal attack rather than reasonable feedback on my approach. It didn't help that I was depending on this work for a paycheck either. I ended up fearing the outcome that paid my rent and dictated my self-esteem. Because my identity was so closely tied to being a writer, my sole focus was on upholding that identity rather than improving my ability and approach. I wasn't able to see the weak spots in my craft because I was blinded by the need to prove that I already was something rather than embracing the process of improving. Seeing other writers and journalists succeed when I had not also felt like a personal affront rather than a reasonable outcome of someone else's hard work. When your ego is tied to a certain outcome, everything feels like a zero-sum game. Their win is my loss, I thought. As I pushed increasingly hard to validate my self-worth through work, I became constrained creatively, and some of my best ideas lay dormant and went ignored. It took many months of rejection letters before I was able to understand that as long as I tied my identity to an outcome that I only had partial control over, I was going to be miserable and produce low-quality work. Once I separated my identity from the work, I was able to get vulnerable, take chances, and really dig into stories that I was passionate about or that challenged me. Now I'm a pro at getting rejected. It just takes years and years of practice. But was it worth it? The proof is in your ears, dear listener. Practice self-compassion. A huge part of being a creative is learning how to deal with rejection. For every piece of writing that we have published or podcast that we have launched, there are many other ideas that fell flat and never saw the light of day. Similarly, our running careers have been built on setbacks and falling short. Failure is inevitable in an athletic life, and the most successful athletes, and writers for that matter, are the folks who persevere and learn from failure the quickest. There's a middle way between over-identifying with a setback, I am a failure, and moving through it too quickly and not absorbing the lesson. On to the next thing. Everyone has experienced setbacks. We've all felt the uncomfortable physiological symptoms like an increased heart rate, upset stomach, a tight chest that accompany missed opportunities. The worst trick that shame and failure play on us is convincing us that we're alone in this feeling. It's just not true. Between the two of us, we've accrued enough failures and setbacks to have doubled the length of this book. We'll spare you the laundry list, but know that you're not alone, even when it feels that way. Zoe's thoughts. A big chunk of my running career was built on failure. In 2018, I DNF'd the Leadville Trail 100, a historic 100-mile race through Colorado's collegiate peaks. It was the longest and most competitive race I'd ever attempted, and I failed. At mile 86, I was done. Wrapped in a space blanket, shivering and sobbing on the side of the trail at 11,000 feet, my day was over. I couldn't walk, much less run, another step. My pacer, tasked with convincing me to keep moving at all costs, had to call Lake County Search and Rescue to evacuate me from the trail. Laying in the dust, I watched what felt like hundreds of feet run, shuffle, and walk past me on their way to the finish line, the place I desperately wanted to be but was not going to reach. Not that day, anyway. 
If I had energy left to feel anything other than cold, tired, and sore, I might have felt embarrassed and ashamed that I was failing in such a public way. Going into the race, a friend told me that no matter what, I better not DNF because according to him, once you quit once, it makes it easier to quit every single time. Once you quit, you become a quitter. Here's the thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. After I was treated for dehydration and hypothermia, quite the combo, my friends and family who I'd been afraid of letting down were actually proud of me. They admired me for putting myself out there and giving my best shot at something really hard even though my very best on that particular day wasn't the peak of my capabilities. On that day, quitting was the right decision for my long-term health and well-being. Moving forward, literally, was no longer a possibility, and having the self-compassion to validate my decision allowed me to move past that failure and learn from it, rather than beat myself up over the outcome. After a few hours of fitful sleep, my crew took me out to get breakfast pizza. We celebrated laughing and hugging like I had finished the race. But still exhausted, I fell asleep face first in a veggie supreme. Despite falling short of my goal, who I was hadn't changed. I was the same brave athlete with big dreams who put herself out there. I hadn't become a quitter. I was someone who made a good decision in tough circumstances and was gentle enough with myself to grow in the process. I learned that love is unconditional, and the people I had the good fortune to be surrounded by that day and many days after, loved and supported me, not because of the things I achieved, but because I was courageous and human and flawed and lovable nonetheless. I learned that outcomes, good or bad, aren't who you are. Successes and failures don't define you, but how you respond to them absolutely does. Ditch the comparisons. One of the biggest barriers to practicing self-acceptance is the unprecedented availability of comparison. Without even getting up from the couch, we can compare ourselves digitally across a variety of platforms, which means we can go from perfectly happy to feeling insecure and inadequate in a matter of seconds. Scrolling through Instagram may offer all the proof we need that our lives are insufficiently glamorous, the drab background of our daily runs thrown into sharp contrast by the dramatic landscapes our peers seem to be running through. Our houses may feel small, our families dysfunctional, and lives generally less exciting in comparison. Says Bracey, quote, In the context of training and racing, this issue almost always boils down to spending too much time comparing yourself to others. In this kind of situation, I would almost always return to values. For example, someone may not feel like they are enough because they aren't training as much as someone else. The trap is that they are focused on only one value or commitment, working hard and improving as an athlete. But maybe one of the reasons they don't train as much is because they are a parent and a partner. Maybe they are very committed to a career that they love. When you look at it holistically from that perspective, you can see that the person is investing in several different values and that the time spent away from training is spent engaging with something else important rather than as not doing enough or being enough. End quote. We can start by paying attention to how and when we engage with social media and to what feelings come up as we start scrolling. When we notice our attention starting to linger on a post, sit with it and try to name the feelings that arise. Envy? Insufficiency? Sadness? Instead of letting those feelings draw us into hours of more self-deprecating scrolling, we could initiate a new thought process. Perhaps the image of a training partner at the finish line with their shiny new PR prompts feelings of inadequacy. Instead of letting a vortex of feelings overtake and misguide your next actions, think or say out loud, I'm happy for my friend. Someone else's success is not my defeat. There is plenty of good to go around. It might feel awkward and forced at first, especially if we're struggling with insecurity, but practice and work on the concepts we're discussing in this book. It will become clear that there is abundance. Supporting others, even if it doesn't feel genuine at first, will change your entire mindset around success. While yes, there are only three spots for an age group award, when we have a rough day on the race course, we may befriend a new runner who is considering dropping out. Our support and encouragement could make them believe that they can do hard things. Our kindness in helping them could be the difference between a one-off race and becoming a lifelong member of the community. Sometimes there are roadmaps to joy in places we never expected. If someone's summit selfie prompts discomfort, 
Remember that many people turn to social media to validate themselves, not to put others down. If we do stumble upon the rare breed of online persona who genuinely delights in putting others down, we have permission to gleefully unfollow them. The person to whom we're comparing our boring, summit-free Saturday morning might be struggling with the same desire to boost their sense of self. In fact, they probably are. A good place to start is by working towards a scenario in which running is a part of us, but not all of us. Think about what you love and admire in other people. Write down what you respect, appreciate, and admire in them. Chances are, very little of that list has to do with what someone has accomplished and everything to do with who that person is. Why would you hold yourself to a different and more arbitrary standard? If someone else did that same practice, what would they love, respect, admire, and appreciate about you? Probably a lot more than just your accomplishments. We are enough just as we are, simply for being. Untangling our identity from our accomplishments is something that can take years. For both of us, when we have successfully let go of accomplishments being our identity in one area, it shows up in another part of our lives. As soon as we stop placing our self-worth on our athletic accomplishments, the temptation to do the same thing with our professional success comes knocking. The bottom line is this. It's an ongoing process. Moving past feelings of not enoughness in our brain can feel like we are constantly being judged by an unwelcome houseguest who won't leave until we do the work to check the foundation. That is exactly why this text is giving you the tools to do it. But that doesn't mean it will be easy. Action steps. Continue to work on accepting yourself for who you are, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Ask yourself why you signed up for a race so close on the heels of your last one. Could you be trying to fill a void that can't be filled with accomplishments? Remember that self-acceptance does not mean loving every tiny detail about yourself. It is understanding that perfectly imperfect is okay. Step off the hedonic treadmill and change things up by signing for something totally different. If you get in the mindset of trying to maximize your distance, stop mid-run to take a mental picture and feel gratitude for the ability to run at all. Write down what you are grateful for in an area you are currently struggling. There is hidden appreciation you have forgotten of late. Sit in your failures and try to understand what didn't work, but also recognize that failure is a part of life. Pay attention to how and when you engage with social media. Notice the feelings that come up when you pause on a post and reframe your thinking to consider what you are not seeing. Their accomplishments do not take anything away from who you are. Write down what you respect, appreciate and admire in other people. Why hold yourself to a different and arbitrary standard? Before we go any further, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Running For Real team. Without them, I would not be able to do barely anything compared to what I'm able to do today. They are behind the scenes. They are there for me. I am just so appreciative of them. To Jeremy Nessel, our podcast editor, audio consultant, and someone who's been with me since the start. To Sally Pontarelli, our content and operations manager, who is there day to day doing all the things to help me be successful. To Kelsey Wang, our head of design, and Louise Murphy, our associate designer. And finally, to Sandy Gutierrez, our photographer and content strategist, I am appreciative of all of you and wouldn't be able to do what I do without you. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. I would love to hear your thoughts on that chapter. That is a chapter that seemed to speak to a lot of people who have read the book so far. If you have read the book so far and you could leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads, that would really mean a lot to me. Uh, those reviews, as we know, go a long way and you could really help me out by going to leave a review on Amazon, on Goodreads or wherever you purchased your book um, and go check out that audiobook if you want to get the rest of it. You can head on over to the links in the show notes. As I said, if you use that link, you can get the audiobook for free if it if you are a first time user. And then I think you can get $5.95 a month for the next four months after that. So it's a very good deal if you've been thinking about it for a while. I also want to thank our sponsors, Tracksmith, uh, Precision, Fuel and Hydration, and AG1. You can go check those out in the show notes as well by going to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 373. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you for a together run next week. And then we'll be uh, for real episode on Wednesday and a regular episode next Friday. See you then.